everyone and welcome to the Australia E-Series E-Talking session tonight. Um, our guest speaker tonight is Richard Olson from the Ideas Lab who's going to be speaking to us uh, in regards to um, the changes in, uh, in current pedagogy, um, the way we're looking at, uh, at how students learn based on the new uh, technology age. So um, I'm very much looking forward to this because it's a uh, topic we have a lot of debates about it at school. So, uh, Richard, I'll hand over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Mick. Um, yes, today I wanted, I guess, to dis uh, discuss around about um, personalisation or self-directedness and not really talk about um, what it is, um, more assuming that people know what it is, but rather talking about how modern technology and uh, I guess new practices and new possibilities made modern made possible by modern technology may um, help us uh, as we achieve as we try to be self directed learners and I guess offer new uh, possibilities for us as educators as we um, try to encourage self directed learning in our classrooms and I guess have, prepare our students to be um, a lifelong learners. I'm just going to pause my backup that's backing up to the cloud as we just noticed. Um, as we do this, um, what I wanted to do today is have a, a bit of discussion. So I thought I'd start with a question and I'll see if I can find my first slide. And maybe if you can type in the chat. I, want, I just basically wondered what our expectation is for uh, technology in our school. So maybe if you've got a uh, chance just to type into the chat what you think your expectations are or our expectations as teachers are, um, are for technology in our schools. I'll give us maybe about a minute. I can see Carol's already written that it needs to be reliable. True. And so students need access to device and technology should be immersive in learning. <laughs> Alison wants an interactive board this big. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty uh, interesting photo, isn't it? Uh, Carol talks about BYOD. Mix uh, simply simply not substituting old teaching methods. Uh, talking about it, uh, Shambles says uh, communication, collaboration, community uh, critical thinking. I love it. And Alison says technology should be supporting the learning and not driving it. Okay, now we've had that, and, I'm, and I'm, uh, I must say this is an Intel photo, and I probably shouldn't use it. And it's it's. The article and the uh, video that goes with the photo is not as bad because now that we've talked about what our, our, our expectations as educators are, I wonder what expectations our students have of technology. Um, this photo was, and I didn't take this photo, this photo was um, from Sydney actually. Um, uh, and Justin Bieber concert in Sydney for uh, one of the morning television programs a couple of months ago when he was out. So um, I wonder what, maybe you can chat and uh, add your ideas in the chat. And if anyone wants to grab the microphone at any stage, please do as well. Maybe what, what expectations, expectations do our students have of technology? Alison's got that it's easy to use, which is pretty interesting. You know, comparing that to you know um, the other comment, where as educators we want it to be reliable, and uh, and shares that expected access 24/7. That's right, they expect to always have it. Carol's talking about BYOD in class. Yeah, Shamble says they expect it just to be there. True. Uh, Mick, easy to use and accessible, and not filtered. Exactly right. Always there. Always working. Um, and this photo talks about social, doesn't it? It's a real social experience. I guess they're all taking photos, but I assume that most of them are. Um, <laughs> somebody says the mum and dad fund it. <laughs> yeah, good point. <laughs> oh, I love it. So that's just an idea. Base. I think I think there are different expectations, and I I think the um, the change that we're really seeing in technology over the last few years has really shown, um, and whatever we want to call it, and I don't really care about putting labels on, but we've really seen a different way that people are using technology. We've really seen a change in expectations. Um, and um, we really need to look at it from both sides, I guess, as educators, but also seeing how students use technology. And that's the point of view that really we've been talking about in the lab over the last year or so, talking about the modern learner. And I guess these people in the photos really are modern learners. They have technology. 
they expect it to work, yeah, and they expect it to be free, whether mum pays for it or whoever pays for it. They expect it to always be available. They expect it to uh, connect it to their friends. So we want to talk about that today, the modern tech learner. And as we're talking about modern learners, we're imagining the people in this photo, the kids in these photos, the people that use technology in their lives and, and their expectations. Um, but before we talk about that, I guess, and this is the question we want to answer today or, or discuss, how does modern technology enable us to be better informed in order to make better decisions about our learning? Because when we're talking about self-directedness, I guess we're talking about taking charge of our learning, we're talking about the path of our learning, we're talking about the pace of our, lear pace of our learning. I guess the other things we talk about is a voice and choice in our learning. And all of those things rely on us making good decisions about our learning. Uh, we can't be successful self-directed learners if we're not making good decisions. And I guess the best decisions we can make is that if we're informed about our learning. So, and I wanted to cover a couple of expectations that I have uh, going into this before we do, and maybe these are disclaimers. I'm assuming that we also have, we have some agreement about how people learn. I'm assuming that we think that, pe that, that we believe that people learn, and I'm not really sure how we articulate it, how you articulate what people learn. It doesn't have to be exactly like this, but I'm assuming that we have some agreement that people learn through experiences that builds on previous learning that allows them to um, have deeper understanding and uh, build knowledge. And the second assumption that I have is that that learning is most effective when it's query based and self-directed and socially constructed. So we learn best when we're exploring real problems, when we're solving things that are relevant to us and to our needs and that we're able to have some choice in and, and that we learn together, that we learn with other people. Um, Carol talks in the chat about creating collaboratively and I, I really agree about that. So that's setting the scene that we want to talk about the modern learner. We assume that people learn like this and, and we, we have some sort of agreement about how people learn and what that means. So with all that out of the way, um, let's, let's look at say how modern technology influences the modern learner to make better decisions about what they learn and how they learn. Um, I've got a question for you. What do um, illegal rubbish dumps, graffiti and, uh, and shopping trolleys out in the street have to, have to do with each other? Anybody got any ideas? Throwaway society, Carol. <laughs> no organisation, Liz, interesting. Anyone else got some ideas? <laughs> I just pinched these photos from the internet. I'm not actually sure. Even though I normally attribute it, I just grabbed them. Um, I'm not really sure where they're from. <laughs> Choice, that's interesting. Um, Well, according, um, maybe I'll add a third, uh, a fourth image to that, and that is the one of the ants and the way that ants self-organise. Uh, according to uh, these two gentlemen, and, and Mark is a, a Melbourneite, so he's an Australian, and, and they talk about stigmergy or stigmergy collaboration. And they, they say, and flipping back to the previous photo, that when we see illegal rubbish dumped, um, somebody dumps some rubbish and people say, oh, that's a good spot. I've got some rubbish, and dump rubbish begets more dump rubbish. The same with graffiti. When somebody graffitis a building, people uh, that people know no, you need to paint over it quickly because other, otherwise, graffiti begets graffiti. People see that oh, this is a good place to do graffiti. I'm going to uh, add my own graffiti there. The same with tro shopping trolleys. Um, when we dump shopping trolleys, they grow. People say oh, somebody else has dumped the shopping trolley there, and that's a good spot. I'm not going back to the normal spot. So it's a collaboration. It's not the collaboration when we normally talk about collaboration, but they call it, they, um, Mark Elliott calls it stigma collaboration and he's done his PhD in it. And it's basically the way that how do, how do people uh, work together when they're not really working together? How do they collaborate when collaboration is not about it? The people collaborating in the dumping the rubbish uh, and not collaborating to make a really big uh, rubbish dump. They're just looking at it. how do they collaborate? How do they work together to find the track from the nest to the food source? And so they talk about stigmergic collaboration. We saw we see other people got other evidence of stigmergic collaboration. You know, we see uh, schools and and other and universities where people don't use the concrete paths, but paths emerge other places between the pivotal spots, and then tracks get merged, um, worn through stigmergic collaboration. 
it's a really interesting uh, concept. And basically what it says is that learning leaves tracks. You know, and for the self-directed learner, the fact that when we actually learn online, when we, uh, when we write tweets, when we uh, write blog posts, when we comment, when we tag, when we like, when we do things, we leave, we leave evidence of our learning. And that learning can actually starts growing into stigmergic collaboration. So the idea that by learning online and by leaving the evidence, that learning leaves tracks that enable self-directed learners to make better choices about their learning. Um, and, and, and we call that stigmergic. And it's saying, well, how can the learning of others inform our learning? And what, what sort of things can we do? Well, we can observe people. When people are, uh, we can observe other learners, we can observe their activities, we can observe the, the, the posts they're writing, we can observe the photos that they're taking, we can observe the things that they're reading if they're leaving evidence of that. We can observe the tags that they're using, we can observe the tweets that they're making. So we can do that. We can also then start imitating. So we can look at learners that are, that are experts or professionals or um, <laughs> know more than us and we can actually start to imitate what they're doing and we start copying them to do that. And as we do that, we, we leave evidence and just like the rubbish dump, more rubbish appeals there and then the track becomes more obvious. So when we start imitating other learners and doing the same things, reading the same things, writing about the same things, leaving evidence, those tracks become easier for other people to follow. And we can also start influencing other people. So we can start making the tracks as well. As we become more confident learners and more knowledgeable about a subject or domain, we can actually um, do that. Oh, Carol wrote, how do we spell that? And I think stigmergic is written by Mick there is the way that you spell it. So that's right. So this idea of doing that. And that's, um, Carol talks about, I think it's Carol, um, talks about watching grandchildren. That's right, imitating what they do. And I guess this is not a new phenomenon and that's why I like the offline examples. But when we start learning online, we start to lead these things. You know, what else happens? We look at, uh, this is delicious. So when I, when somebody bookmarks it, we can put actually a tag on it and we can actually see the other people that have bookmarked a, um, the same pages and we can actually then look at the tags they've used. And for instance, we might look at the tags and say, oh, I don't know what those tags are. Maybe I need to investigate it. So those tags are tracks, evidence that we can say, well, we're interested in that. We might investigate it. So it gives some evidence. You know, also a follow list. When, when you get new to Twitter, what you do, you start looking at um, other people that are similar to you, that have similar interests, and you actually look at who they're following, don't you? And that's, that's evidence. That's a track that we can look and we can say, oh, we're going to follow that. And as more people follow the same people, that track becomes wider. And so, the, and as you get extra followers, and actually follow account too is a track. So the idea is that this influences other people. <laughs> Carol, I'll, I'm, I'm probably will mention Twitter a few more times, I'm sorry. So I just try to block your ears when I say the T word. Yeah, and we also see, so we see blog posts too, writing, reading, all those things, they all leave tracks, evidence as people start doing that. Um, Google Read is another thing too, you know, as we can, you know, used to be able to share items that you read so other people can do that. So there's lots of ways and lots of activities that we now do online and in the social web where we can actually leave evidence. And as we leave evidence, we can influence people. And that influence can and really introduce that. And I guess we need to rethink that. If we're going to take advantage of this, what does it mean for transparency? You know, if we're learners, do we only share our successes? Or do we also share our failures? Do we share our half-baked ideas and not just our full-baked full ideas? If leaving tracks really helps other self-directed learners make better decisions about their learning, what should we be sharing? Now, what should all learners be sharing if, if we recognise that it's going to benefit other people? And I'll be interested to, uh, to and, and, and I guess this is a question for the chat again, or if anybody wants to take the microphone and, and talk about the idea of stigmergic collaboration or this idea that learning leaves tracks. What tracks are we leaving? What tracks are you leaving as you use the internet um, about the way that you operate, about the things that you do online, the things that you do to support your learning that enables you to be a lifelong learner? I guess we're all adults here and we're all professionals. So what are the tracks that you're leaving? I'd be interested to see um, somebody grab the microphone or maybe uh, type in the chat what tracks you think you're leaving as you uh, are a self-directed online lifelong learner.
So I'll give uh, 30 seconds or a minute of free space, if that's all right, Nick, for maybe people to grab the microphone or people to um, type in the chat. Go for it, Carol. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, look, I'm really intrigued with what you're saying here, and I've just been thinking recently because of my Twitter experience how important it is that we are responsible in the tracks that we leave because people are following us and looking up to us in some respect and you know with that incident that I uh, felt <laughs> this week about people just going to whatever they thought was a message from me from Twitter because they respect what I do and say and it wasn't from me at all you know, it made me think really seriously about um, the privacy part of Twitter uh, and how I conduct myself online and I really think that it has to be professional at all times. Um, I'm hoping that I do that. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because I guess if, if we see that, and I, I'm with you, I must admit, I use Twitter, uh, you know, very professionally, I think, and try to see that. Um, I also believe, you know, adding some personal things helps that sometimes. But it's interesting to say, you know, it really is interesting to say, what does it mean if other people are watching and what sort of influence will I have? Um, and says she's quite, it's hard to share your files, and I'm not suggesting that we show all failures, and obviously we want to do that, but it, it's an interesting point, Anne, um, that it is difficult to share some of those things. Um, yeah, Liz talks about perhaps we should be sharing new understandings and new ideas, I, I agree. And uh, the internet will map your tracks, footprints, see the tools you do it, so there's a list of tools that um, Shambles Guru's got, so um, that's interesting. I use, and I must admit, I, I keep an archive of my tweets, and we're not talking about Twitter, Carol, too much, I'm sorry, and um, you know, I use a thing called uh, ThinkUp, I think, which I, on a website archives that and all my connections so that I can do that. So that's the first um, idea that I want, or new reality that I wanted to cover, this idea that learning leaves tracks today. I wanted to now switch, switch our focus to, to other ways that modern learners um, are better informed to make better decisions about their own learning, modern self-directed learners. And, oh, whoops, I've got a, because my slide's uploaded in the wrong order. Let me try here. Um, this is a heart rate monitor connected to a watch. Um, this is a Fitbit device which you put on your belt and it's, uh, it's like a um, pedometer and it measures your, how far you went and whether you want, I, I'm not sure if it's got GPS as well. I think Harvey and Norman sell these and a bunch of other things and you can download the, the figures to your computers and see um, what's going on with how far you walked. You can wear it while you're sleeping as well and it'll tell you how well you slept and what hours you slept. So it really tracks your things. Yeah, that's right, Shamble says there's an app. There's lots of apps around these. And if you've got apps that you've used, can you please share them in the, um, the chat while we go about it? We might get some people to talk if they're happy. Um, too. This is somebody who's not really used an app for this, but he's actually just recorded over the over periods of his life. This is what the last 15 years, what he's what he did, methods of learning, the people that he interacted with, uh, his monthly income, um, what he thought he'd do when he grew up. So this is some data that he's just generated uh, manually. Um, this is actually a school that looked at um, students looked at. Um, what they did during the day and they used a, a colour-coded chart to talk about what they did um, and where their time was. And even something like, and I guess there's in the fitness realm, there's, as um, Shamble says, there's lots of apps, there's things like RunKeeper, I'm not sure if anybody uses RunKeeper, and lots of running apps that tell how far you ran, whether you ran up and down, and keeps a record of of your, your march towards fitness and how you're going as a way of giving feedback, encouraging you. There's apps where you can track your mood. There's apps where you can track all this sort of data. But also, so there's all those specific apps and data analytics, as Alison says, and learning analytics. No, but even when we use Microsoft Word, you know, I'm doing a major piece of writing at the moment and word count, you know, sits, sits at me and stares at me. <laughs> it talks about how slowly I'm writing. But we've also got lots of other things. Um, Mick talks about using runs on me wrong. But word, count, um, word does lots of other things too. You know, we can use grammar checks. It can tell us how many uh, words per sentence. It can tell us how long we've been editing the document. We can run uh, 
we can run macros and look at how many unique words we do. So we can look at the vocabulary expressed in our writing. So as we use modern technology, there's a whole bunch of data that we can use, and there's a link there to visualising data. And we can use lots of data to, to actually tell how we're going personally. So I guess as teachers and educators, we're really familiar with using data for assessment, you know, tests and test scores and marks and grades. But um, increasingly, um, with through apps and things, and uh, there's sort of this been this movement of this idea of the quantified self. I'm not sure if people are um, up with this idea, but these are two guys, Gary Wolf and Kevin Ke uh, Kevin Kelly. They're both from Wired, and they've started uh, this blog and started meetups around the quantified self. And I don't think they invented quantified self, and they wouldn't say that, but they've got some really interesting ideas. And the, the idea is, as the tagline for their their blog says, um, you know, self knowledge through numbers. So the idea of now that we use technology, now that we carry around a phone and a GPS, now we have all these apps that we can carry around about, we can actually then use that information to make better decisions about our lives. You know, and through Quantified Self, there's lots of stories about weight loss and people measuring themselves. You know, you can get scales that, sorry Carol, block your ear, you can get scales that will tweet out your, uh, your weight every day if that's what you want to do. You know, people take photos of their meals. People use these devices to actually do all this data. So it's really interesting the way that they do this and look at self analytics. You know, we talk about learning analytics, but this is really self analytics that allows and empowers. And I guess for the for the self directed learner, this idea, you know, that we can use data to, to look at ourselves that now that we use technology it generates all this rich data and we can actually see what's happening. You know, when we use Word, we can look at the data and see what it says about our writing. Not that it would necessarily be the only indicator, but it is an indicator for us to make better decisions. And if we go back to our, uh, I guess, initial preposition that making better decisions is the key to self successful self-directed learning and making better decisions are, are allows and requires us to be better informed, that this idea of uh, self-generated data and um, quantified self is a great, way, a great way for people to explore that. Um, is data more beneficial than to learning than assessment? Now, these, and there's also in the health field. The other big thing is um, there's a website called Is It Heal Me? And there's all these people with uh, chronic illnesses and chronic conditions that are just sharing their symptoms, sharing their everyday things, sharing their diets, and actually together looking at things. And then as they modify things and as they do self experiments and as they see the changes in their symptoms, they're able to do that. And these people are now taking this data that they're generating about themselves to their doctors. So there's people that are really empowering. We're actually seeing the health industry really turn on its head by this idea of empowering the patients to take data. So rather than the, the uh, hospitals and the doctors doing tests on the patients, the patients are taking the data themselves and then taking it to them. Yeah, and it's it's a really interesting idea. And I'd say what are the opportunities for us as teachers and what are the opportunities for our students to look at the, the new opportunities around uh, data when, you know, Lots of kids now have doing all their work on, on, on online, they're using Word, they're blogging, so they're actually storing all their work electronically. Often they do might have smartphones or iPads or other things too that they can use these little apps to actually monitor themselves and then allow themselves to make better decisions about how they learn and what they learn. So it's a really interesting idea, this quantified self idea. And what are people doing? Well, they're, they're doing updates. So they might do it manually. They might just say, this is how I'm feeling. There's one app. Oh, what's it called? Oh, I can't, feel, I can't remember what it's called. It just basically says, you know, rate how you're feeling today between 1 and 10. It's as simple as that. And then people can actually uh, gauge their mood and how they're feeling and I guess their outlook on life just by a simple, simple measurement. So update. We see some team people use Twitter to update their status or Facebook to update that. So we're doing that. We're also seeing like um, seamless logging now too to allow data to be automatically generated with some of these apps, the running data. We don't have to update. We don't have to say how far we ran. It automatically organises it. When we type in Word document, we don't have to say how many words we've written. 
it automatically logs that. So we see some updating, manual updating, but we see some automatic or seamless logging. And I guess the most important part is the idea of um, analysing that data. So now that we have pretty powerful tools and um, it was shared before about some data visualisation tools that we now have, it's really easy for people to take that data and to, to look at it and do that and look at that. Yeah. Another, another example too about earthquakes and live data, uh, Anne says, um, she loves using the Yelp and Herbal Spoon to get people's opinions. That's right, so it's interesting. So, and I guess there's lots of different ways that we can use data to be better informed about our decisions and this idea of quantified self. Um, and how can we use assessment to empower learning? So it's turning assessment on its head. It's not turning assessment, it's, and I guess we're talking about assessment for learning or assessment as learning rather than assessment of learning if we're going to put it in teacher speak. And how can we actually use data to allow students to make decisions as they go uh, about that and is this a skill that the modern learner needs? Um, so I wanted just to reflect on this if we've got a minute or two and just think about this idea of quantified self and just think about idea about the way that we can generate data, the ideas of updating and logging and analysing and ask the question how could, how can your students use learning analytics, learning analytics to make better decisions about their own learning? Have people got any thoughts on that? Does anyone want to grab the microphone and share or type in the chat if we have another uh, minute or two? Oh, Carol talks about e-portfolios, and yeah, and I, I agree. I think e-portfolios really were the pe precursor to this. Um, lots of work, and it really is around that same idea of reflecting on what you're doing and sharing what you're doing. It, you know, especially e-portfolios, which is you know sharing the process rather than waiting to the end of the year and sharing a standard portfolio or, or waiting to a, a parent student centered conference or whatever. Uh, thank you, Carol. Has anybody else got any ideas around or any thoughts about this? Yeah, and Anne talks about the different mediums. That's a good point, Anne. You know, we see the idea of the YouTube blogger and, and just talking to the camera and it's, it is, a, a, I guess, a check-in and a reflection, which is along these same ideas, yeah. Yeah, uh, Alison says, empowers learners to know where they are in the learning process. Thanks. Um, Mick says, um, that's something we do at the moment. Yeah, and I, I guess I think this whole talk yeah, you know, I must admit, all this whole session, really, Mick, I agree with that. That I think it's a very, oh, I don't know if it's a new area. It's something that we're not, not quite. You know, I think there are enormous opportunities. So I don't think this session is wasting people's time. But also, I think you know. I'm not sure that we, you know, I think we've only touched the surface of what might be possible. And I know like universities are looking at learning analytics, but they're more looking at retention rates and how can we identify students that might be struggling where this idea of quantified self and um, using data to inform our decisions is coming from the other side and saying how can learners do that. Um, Somebody talks about, uh, Alison talks about Card Academy, and Card Academy does give you feedback, you're right, gives you analytics. Um, Evernote, I'm not sure, Mick, agree. Um, uh, Evernote and Dropbox, I think, yeah, data silos, so yeah, that's Shamwell says the same thing. Yeah, And it's interesting, you know, that's right, and people are starting to look at those analytics, but I guess it's not looking at analytics for an assessment and so saying this is how many people. We really get a fine tune and the idea of uh, quantified self is basically saying let's do a scientific experiment on my, and there's tons of case studies on that site and I, I recommend if you're interested in this sort of thing really have a look at that site, it's quite interesting and as Alison said there's lots of other sites that are looking at learning analytics and it really is a quite interesting thing but this idea of um, I guess quantified self and the for the self can be really small, can start off and I guess people have been doing it since day dot and the idea of journaling and reflecting but this idea of how easy it is now and the way that we can actually grab it in so yeah <laughs> and it is a little bit of a big brother and I guess that's we need to think too is about well what are the ethics about this and I think sometimes if we're sharing data that you know assessment is, is one thing but if we're sharing some of this data maybe if I'm not feeling bad it's not exactly public data you know we've talked about learning leaves tracks just before and don't necessarily think that this data is necessarily data that we'd necessarily want to share um, and you're right. I wanted to, okay so we're going to move on now and, and looked at that, we've looked at um, stick merger collaboration um, 
we have looked at um, that learning leaves tracks. Now, then we looked at uh, quantified self, and we looked at how data informs a self-directed learner. I want to now we switch to a third, I guess, new reality of the modern self-directed learner. Um, I want to talk about lolcats and the Occupy movement and pencil chat, and I want to talk about how. For a little while last year, everybody seemed to be blogging about serendipity. Well, everybody in education, a lot of people that I was reading, I was talking about serendipity. I'm sorry, I can't get a great example. I wish I'd taken a screenshot off my uh, Google Reader at that stage. So what do um, lolcats, Occupy Movement, uh, Pencil Chat, and uh, people blogging about serendipity have to do with uh, self-directed learner and being better informed and being uh, and making better decisions because we're better informed as self-directed learners. Well, um, Susan Blackmore says that uh, all these things are examples of memes. Are people, are people up with what a meme is? I guess a meme is an idea that uh, is easily transferred and easily copied and, and spreads. Um, uh, and Susan's got a, a really interesting TED talk, um, um, and she talks about different memes. And she talks about you know the folded toilet paper as a meme, and why do we go to a hotel and anywhere around the world and we'll find the toilet paper folded into a nice little triangle because it's a meme, because it's spread, because it gives some idea that the toilet's been cleaned when really it just shows that somebody's touched the toilet paper. Um, this, and she talks about memes, and basically what she says is that memes, by their very nature, cannot be prevented. Prevented, and she's talking about ideas that can be copied and they can replicated so that they spread. And I guess she's talking about really good ideas that really good memes will be spread. And I guess when we go back to the ones that we talked about here, you know, lolcats became very became an internet sensation because loads of people got cats, loads of people have cameras, and it's easy to do a dodgy. Uh, you don't even need Photoshop to make the dodgy title on the photo. It's really easy to do it in paint or whatever you want to use. And to upload a photo is small and nice and easy. And they're cute and everybody liked it. So it was easy to copy. It was easy to come up with a new idea. So lolcat spread became a meme because, um, and thanks Mick for the, the link to Susan Blackmore, um, because it was easy to copy, because it resonated. And so it was an interesting idea. <laughs> uh, Carol's pushed it across to teapotting. I'm not really sure about teapotting. We'll, I'll, I'll search that one after this afternoon. Yeah, the Occupy movement as well. Last year was it? Last year it's it's it shot around the world um, because it was an easy idea, even though it wasn't that well defined. Maybe some people said, but it was easy. It, it resonated. It was an easy way to. Uh, I guess to uh, respond to it, and it, it really captured the imagination. So it spread quite easily. Um, pencil chat was big for a day, and I've mentioned Twitter again, Carol. I, I apologise. Um, pencil chat was big, I, a big, for, and this was where people were using Twitter to talk about uh, modern technology and learning, yeah, and juxtaposing against the idea of. Uh, pencils. And so they were putting common ideas and common complaints about technology-based learning uh, against the idea of pencils to, I guess, uh, highlight why it was silly. And um, it was an easy way to do it. People could think up an interesting thing because it showed commonality. It was really easy to tweet. So some of these things, it was easy to copy. It was easy to replicate. It was easy to share. So it actually grew. Um, and the same too with people saw blog posts about something and they do that. So this idea that a meme regrets that, uh, spreads around that. And, and this is very amusing as well. So I think the third new reality for the uh, modern self-directed is that self-directed learner is that powerful ideas spread. That when an idea on the internet, the internet has an, an amazing ability to, uh, to amplify really powerful ideas. And for the self-directed learner, that's <laughs> an amazing fact and really great as well because it means that great ideas will come across and they'll spread and we'll be able to see them. You know, so the bigger the idea, the better the idea, the, the newer the idea, the more noteworthy the idea, the harder it will be for, um, <laughs> for the self-directed learner to miss it. Which is really great because it does it helps them filter that. And it says not only do they spread, but they get built upon. And I guess that's why, and that's why they become more powerful. I totally agree. And so this idea of being able to replicate and copy these powerful ideas, and that's really, um, I guess, empowering for the self-directed learner that they're not going to miss the important stuff. You know, sometimes when we're self-taught, 
we like to go off to a course or read a book just to check that there's not a big thing that we don't know about. Whereas this idea that the powerful ideas spread across the internet really shows this idea, really says that we're not going to miss out on those important things. Um, Carol says, I really agree with this new reality, powerful ideas spread. I see this more and more in our networks in the last 12 months. I couldn't agree more, Carol. Um, and we talked about memes. Is the crowd better than experts at really highlighting these important things? And what's happened? Well, we can copy an idea, we can modify it, as Anne said, we can build upon it and improve it and we can distribute it. And that's the important part of these powerful ideas. We've got to be able to copy it. We've got to be able to build upon it, as Anne said, and we've got to be able to distribute it. So that's what modern uh, self-directed learners do. And as we do that, as we copy it, as we distribute it, as we build upon it, that powerful idea becomes even more powerful or becomes even harder to miss for the self-directed learner, which is great. <laughs> I see a prophecy we've got coming up. <laughs> I read that a very long time ago. I don't know why I read that. Um, what does it mean for curriculum? Who determines what's an important idea in your school? Who's in, who's in, who determines what's important to know? You know sh is there a place where self-directed learner, the lifelong learner, learning online, the curriculum is not as important as seeing what comes up and what, what the crowd and what the community and what our network of learners deems as important? You know, so it's a really interesting idea of turning curriculum on its head. So uh, this third reality, the idea that powerful ideas, ideas spread, and what are the opportunities? How are, our, are our students able to recognise and respond to new opportunities? Um, I'd love to, maybe I know people have been sharing on the side, does anybody want to grab the microphone and quickly reflect on this idea of powerful ideas? I know there's lots of things there. Or does um, somebody want to um, share what they've been sharing in the chat or, um, or add some? I'll just give maybe a minute if anyone wants to grab the microphone. And go for it. Grab those new opportunities a lot quicker than we do as teachers or educators. I find they often will come with something to school and respond to it very quickly and take it off in a new direction. I don't know what other people think there. Yeah, it's interesting and I guess Minecraft is a great example of this, isn't it? What a powerful idea and a powerful opportunity and there's probably nobody in the uh, the Western world, <laughs> the internet connected world that doesn't know about Minecraft now and doesn't know how great it is for learning. You know, I was talking to some people the other day and they said our oh, parents are just so happy that there's actually a good computer game out there that's beneficial for my students' learning, it's uh, for my child's learning. It's really interesting. Uh, does anybody else want to build on what Anne was saying or add their own ideas? Oh, and Alison talks about, yes, I know we're, we're talking uh, tonight in the um, in the make-believe world in somewhat. We're talking about the utopian world, you know, but I think, you know, there are issues. I guess there are big issues around year 11 and 12, for sure. Um, but I think, you know, we need to look and say what's going to happen there. Oh, and Shambles has got something on Minecraft. The links keep coming. It's fantastic. So we've talked about... Um, that learning leaves tracks, the idea of stick merging. We've talked about for the self-directed learner that data informs. Um, and we've talked and um, for quantified self. Here we talked about powerful ideas and the way that memes and big ideas spread across the internet for the self-directed learner. There's a, a last, a fourth reality that I want to share. Um, and that's this idea. And what I've shown here is some screenshots for GitHub. Um, GitHub is a a, com a website or a community where you, and it's, it's linked to a protocol where you can actually share your a program. So you can write programs and you can share your programs that you write. But what's interesting is that it's the same place that Facebook shares their open source projects. It's the same place that Microsoft shares their open source projects. It's the same place that Twitter shares their projects and it's the same place that Richard Olson shares his projects. So it's interesting that I can share and operate in the same community and share my work as a novice and as an amateur that the real heavy hitters and absolute professionals and experts in the field of programming share theirs. Stack Overflow is another programming and I'm giving programming websites, another programming community which has professionals and experts in the same place sharing and learning together. And I've talked about Twitter again, Carol, I'm sorry. This is a screenshot of 
some of the people that I follow. Um, and the reason why I've picked these people out, yeah, it's, it's a strange name, um, GitHub, it, yeah, and I can't explain what it's for, but it's interesting. It's a hub and it's Git because I don't know what Git stands for. But these people that I've shared, and I've grabbed them for a reason, um, and I just looked at their bios when I grabbed these people. Um, Nathan is a private school teacher. Anne Marie, who I know and I used to teach with, is a special school teacher. Uh, Jack is a student teacher. Michael is a substitute teacher. Deb is a Catholic principal. As we, as self directed learners and lifelong learners, move our learning community onto these spaces, as Microsoft, as the programmers from Microsoft move onto GitHub and move onto Stack Overflow, as teachers move their learning onto the internet, onto places like Twitter and Facebook and into their blogs and develop a community of practice. Our communities of practice are no longer limited to just the experts and the professionals. When we used to go to university, we only um, learnt with and collaborated with other people that were learning. They weren't the experts, they weren't professionals. We were pretending. It was faked, it was stimulated, it was stimulated learning. Simulated learning, I mean. Whereas the experts who were doing the jobs that we aspired to were learning situated within their practice. Um, and this comes from the ideas around uh, Jean Lieb and Edna Wagner talking about situated learning and community of practice because learning, while well, things like tonight is uh, valuable, I think, and otherwise we wouldn't all be here, but real learning happens when we do the job. Real learning happens when we're situated in the practice. Real learning for teachers happens when we're teaching, in the classroom, able to trial our ideas, when we're situated in learning. Uh, real learning in any job happens when we're situated within the practice. But when these communities of practice move online, like Twitter, it's no longer just limited to the professionals. It's no longer just limited to the experts. It's now limited also. It now includes to the student teachers. It now includes to parents. Maybe even students can be in the community of practice of educators, which was once just the limit of, or just the domain of the experts and the professionals. To me, this is mind blowing. And to me, for the self directed learner, talking about how we can uh, make better decisions, really to say that we can be in a community of practice with experts and professionals on any field. We can be in the community of practice. If we love photography and we're just an amateur photographer, we can be with, we can find where they are online, where the community of practice is happening, whether it's in Flickr or on Google Plus or where that community is happening, and we can operate and learn with and be embedded in the learning with, with the professionals and with the experts. It's an amazing opportunity. No longer is our learning need to be fake. No longer does our learning need to be uh, simulated. Because I think that now, when we learn online, everything is scaffolding. Because now we can participate within the learning community that the professionals and learning users. No longer do we rely on. Yes, there's still. A, I'm not saying there's not a difference between the no, absolute novice. I think you know there'll still be some scaffolding requires. But the fact that we can now operate in the real thing, it's authentic learning. We can be authentically situated in the learning. And for self self-directed learner, I think this is amazing. And we and I've talked about situated learner learning, talking about how do we get into situated learning, what does that mean, and what do we do when we're in these communities of practice? Now I think the first step is that we lurk, and I think lurking is valuable. You know, um, you know, not necessarily we we don't always have to be um, posting and writing and tweeting and blogging and taking photos and showing evidence. Sometimes just being able to observe observe and see what the experts and professionals and other passionate amateurs are, are doing is really interesting. You know, even things like today, we don't always have to be adding something, we don't always have to be chatting, we don't have to always have to be talking. We can sometimes just observe and lurk and see what the experts are doing and that enables us to make better decisions about what we're doing when we see what other people are doing and that comes similar to the ideas around learning leaves tracks when we observe people. You know, but when we move up through the scale, we start off by lurking and then we start to negotiate our, our role within this community of practice and we see where we fit and as we do that we start to 
negotiate and, and work out what this community of practice, what the needs are, what our place is. And, our, and as we move through that process, we look about engaging fully in the practice and being a full member in that community of practice. Uh, Alison says she agrees about lurking, just like lurking in the classroom. And I reckon it's a great point because sometimes we always say we need to do that. but. Um, Sometimes it's great just to observe and see what other people are doing and really consider that. And now that we, these great communities of professionals and experts are doing that, our ability to lurk is just so much more. Yeah, it's interesting. Maybe it is an oxymoron. Good point. Of course, this needs to rethink openness. What does it mean? You know, if we actually see the value of these. Um, communities of practice that are authentic that are involved in the experts and professionals you know what are the opportunities for openness and what does that mean what does it mean it's great that you guys are running these sessions that are free and open to anybody really I, I don't think you need to show that you're a teacher card to uh, log into something but it means more and more when we see things like this it really allows other people to come into these communities of practice and this um, series of workshops is a great example of these open communities of practice that actually allows anybody to come in it's not just restricted to the professionals it's not just restricted to the to the experts and I think we need to see more and more of that <laughs> well there you go yeah no it's, I thought it was sixty dollars and uh, so moving on to this how do we respond as schools to students as a, autonomous web connected self-directed learners and we've talked about four realities the reality that learning leaves tracks the the, uh, the reality that data informs the, the quantified self learner. We've talked about the way that powerful ideas spread and now we've talked about the idea that everything is scaffolding, that when we have these rich and vibrant uh, communities of practice online that anybody can join in and anybody can actually interact with the experts and professionals. We can just see what, uh, what great opportunities are. Um, it was really I think Mick talked about before that really we you know we don't do no, I don't think people do schools do much in this space and maybe in the um couple of minutes we have left we could maybe talk about those what are the real opportunities for looking at modern technology to redefine self-directed learners does this does modern technology and what it offers now really give us a chance to I guess have authentic self-directed learning in our classroom practice so, or are the barriers still too great and is it too really too hard for us within the constraints that we have I'd love to hear people's thoughts or if anybody's got any questions or want to add some uh, ideas that would be great too Carol, go for it, please. Richard, I'm just absolutely gobsmacked at the amount of um, learning that's gone through my brain tonight from what you've been uh, presenting for us, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make a comment, not from the school's perspective, because I'm in the vet sector. I think that self-directed learning for the adult learner is about to take off uh, probably quite deeply um, and I've got no other uh, research to base that on other than a gut feeling. Um, what I'm seeing in place, places where I'm uh, giving mentoring to teachers and so on, that so many more of their learners need and want that whole experience of directing their own learning, uh, but they're not quite sure yet how they do that and so there's a big need for for us in the field of um, mentoring teachers on how they do that for their learners so it's, it's something that's driven me along for a long time thanks so much for your presentation oh, thanks Carol I, I totally agree and I I think people like the people we've got in this room and the way that teachers I think it's remarkable the way that teachers have really become so a lot of teachers have and maybe it is just the innovators and the early adopters but a lot of teachers have really taken control of their professional learning um, and really been self-directed and, and I think it can't help but shake up the way that we do professional learning in the, um, in the teaching profession because really people can Take, power, take charge of their own professional learning in a way that schools and other people just can't provide the relevance for them. Um, and I agree that in the vet sector, in higher education for sure, I think university courses and set curriculums can't hope to keep, uh, can't hope to compete with um, 
what's now available as a self-directed learner taking charge of the learning. I'm not saying there's not a role for them, but I'm saying it's a real challenge for them to um, address what that role is. Thank you so much, Carol, for your, your thoughts. Has anybody else wanted to say anything just before? And um, maybe we'll hand back to Mick if there's not. Yeah, Richard, um, yeah, this entire session has been absolutely fantastic. There's really been so much to think about here. Yeah, there's, there's a few things I've sort of sort of been writing down and thinking about while we've been um, talking. And, you know, to me this really is a, an entirely different approach to assessment and I just and it's a really refreshing way to look at things. Um, yeah, I, I know quite a lot of schools do, you know, have students recognising their own needs, but you know if they're actually finding a way to um, to use technology to do that, uh, I just think is um, extremely inspiring and and um, a really interesting concept that I, I'm looking forward to spending a bit more time looking at. I also just love that line you used in there, um, passionate amateurs. I uh, just that's a fantastic way to describe. Even though we're all professionals in teachers, but you know, the idea that we're not um, the professionals that people supposedly go and see. We are the sort of the amateurs that are just going about our jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. I just, I love that description. So, um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much, Richard. Is there any other comments from anybody else? Well, um, uh, thank you, everyone. If you want to um, grab the microphone, I am writing a book, which this is one part of. Uh, when I finally ever release it, hit me up and uh, remind me that I've offered you a free copy, and I'll send you a free uh, electronic copy of the book. Fantastic, and that's been recorded, so there's evidence for that now. Um, all right, well, I'll stop the recording at, at this stage then, if no one else has anything to add.